two of Star Trek Picard picks up directly after the events of season one, where Picard must be coping with the fact that he's now an android by drinking heavily because he's making hundreds of bottles of wine on a planet without money. That night we learn that Laris's husband, Shaban, has died from a serious case of plot necessity and that Laris now wants herself a tall cup of Jean-Luc P. Extra, extra hot. Picard declines her advances and opts to think about his childhood with his mother instead. But we don't stay in the past for too long. We need exposition and a lot of it. Picard delivers a speech at Starfleet Academy and calls out Elnor for being the first fully-blooded Romulan cadet, an act which may be more exclusionary than welcoming. Meanwhile, Info Dump Gerardi lets us know that the synth ban has been lifted in the Federation. She was not sent to prison for murdering Bruce Maddox because, as we all know, if a mind melt doesn't make sense, it's a great defense. And we also learn she's not getting busy with Rios anymore because he's riding a ship instead. He's captain of the Stargazer now. Not the classic one, a new one. And his former ship, the La Serena, is now being captained by Seven of Nine, who's out being a non-specific badass fighting off pirates and being the sexy rebel girlfriend to Rafi, who's now back in Starfleet. La Serena is damaged in an attack, so Seven contacts Rios for help, just in time for a mysterious anomaly in space to be detected, and for Rios to grab Gerardi and Seven to investigate it. The signal from the anomaly is discovered to be saying, Help us, Picard. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Picard is getting trashed with Guinan, who looks older because she wants to, and they talk about how Picard can't find love because of his boyhood trauma. After drinking enough to kill a small Gorn, Picard returns home, but he's not there for long because the Starfleet Admiral takes him to the anomaly, leaving Laris behind without a goodbye. Anyway, Picard's in space. He addresses the anomaly and a Borg ship emerges. The Borg asks to join the Federation and they allow one member aboard the Stargazer. A queen materializes wearing a mask and starts draining power from the ship and taking control of the other ships in the fleet because Starfleet is now using Borg tech in their ships, making assimilation even easier. <laughs> Picard activates the autodestruct and the Queen says something to him that his mother did before he wakes up in his study at home. He sees things are much different now. He drinks coffee, not tea. He wears clothes that resemble Neil Patrick Harris and Starship Troopers, and he collects humanoid skulls. This is all the work of Q. He shows up and goes from Classic Q to Silver Fox Q and insanely rants to Picard before disappearing. All the main cast is here in a totalitarian, human-centric world, home to the Confederation. Seven of Nine is the president, but she's fully human now. They all remember their old lives, and Seven gets the band back together to figure out what's going on, just in time for a celebration of the founding of the Confederation. The Confederation is planning to celebrate by killing the last Borg Queen, but the Queen tells them she knows where the timeline split. Our crew makes off with the Queen in La Serena, and uses the old Slingshot Around the Sun trick to go back to 2024 to try and correct the timeline. Now, La Serena is in some pretty rough shape from seeing some serious shit at 88 miles per hour and crashes into Earth. The good news? It crashes into Picard's winery where no one's around to see it. The bad news? The Queen is unconscious and Elnor dies. It's a shame he didn't get to board the last boat to the Undying Lands. Anyway, the new objective is to find the Watcher, someone who can help them. Don't worry, you didn't miss any extra information by watching this instead of the actual season. Gerardi decides to partially combine with the Queen to get the transporters back. She succeeds and acts her butt off in the process, meaning we can transport now. Rafi and Seven explore LA, commenting on present-day America, but Rios isn't so lucky. Gerardi sucks at transporting, so he materializes several feet in the air and takes a John Wick fall, landing face down on the sidewalk. He's taken to a free clinic and is treated by a doctor named Teresa. He's pretty beat up, but she's attractive and funny, so he's doing pretty well, all things considered. That is until Ice decides to raid the place and arrest Rios because he's a Spanish-speaking man with no papers. So clearly he's a massive threat to national safety. He's thrown into one of those holding cell cages before being deported to Mexico, despite the fact that he's from Chile. Way to go, U.S. government. Anyway, Seven and Rafi break him free by using some Fast and the Furious science, and all is well again. Oh yeah, and in the process, Seven and Rafi teleport in front of several cops, and Rios loses his comm badge. Does any of this cause issues? Nope! We also see that Q is living on Earth, powerless. Does his assuming the role of an engineer and psychiatrist cause any issues? Nope! As he explains how he did this with no powers? Nope! Anyway, Picard decides to join the festivities and teleports right outside of Guinan's bar. He goes in and she has no idea who he is. Now, of course, this is pretty strange since she met him back in the 1900s when she was Whippy Goldberg, but hey. Wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Guinan talks about how we're killing the planet and how lots of us suck before Picard tells her his name and she takes him to the Watcher. She's a woman named Talon and looks exactly like Laris. Is this ever explained? Nope, but she is a supervisor, the same type of person as Gary Seven in the original series. They protect significant historical events from being tampered with. Her job is to protect Rene Picard, one of JL's ancestors who's going to be making a discovery on a space flight happening in a few days. The problem? Rene has anxiety and depression and just like John Luke is fond of the drink. Also, Q wants to stop her because of reasons. Since Q can't or maybe just won't handle things himself, he enlists the help of Dr. Adam Soong, another member of the Soong clan and newest writing choice to keep Brent Spiner on the series. We see that he wants to start doing some crazy biological experiments and is trying to petition a committee for more resources. Lorraine McFly is like, nah, son, so he goes home. It turns out he's trying to save his daughter, Corey, who bears a striking resemblance to Soji and Dodge from Season 1. 
We see that she's fatally allergic to literally everything, and if she goes outside, she'll die. After his begging to violate ethics laws earlier, Adam is told that all his funding will be cut and his licenses will be revoked. He's obviously unhappy about this, but we see that Q left him a business card on his 3D printer, and he'll help Corey in exchange for Soong stopping Renee's lunch. Q gives Soong a sample of the antidote, and it works. For about five minutes until those allergies come roaring back. Speaking of plans, to and our displaced heroes decide to go to a big gala to protect Renee and to convince her to go through with her flight. This involves some high-tech shenanigans, which means we need Jurati. Unfortunately, she's not in the partying mood as she's covered in blood. See, when the Queen came to, she was still being evil like always and decided to call the cops to try and cause a little havoc for our heroes. Jurati found her about to kill a police officer, and she opts to shoot her with a shotgun. As she lay dying, Jurati goes up to her and the Queen touches her face and transfers her consciousness into Jurati. That's right, baby, for the rest of the season, we've got a Gaius and Six situation going on here, except that there's a lot more one-upping one another and a lot less banging. But none of our heroes know Jurati is the new Borg heiress, and they continue the plan to infiltrate the gala. Jurati gets caught immediately, but it's all part of the plan to have her upload fake IDs for the crew from the security office. Everything goes swimmingly, except that there's now a Borg Queen loose in LA. But that's awfully sad, so let's get happy again. Card manages to convince Renee to go through with her launch, Rios enjoys the hell out of some food and cigars, and Jurati goes on stage and sings the entire song all by herself. So much for lying low, but it's all part of the Queen's plan. With Jurati full of endorphins from her performance, the Queen grabs control and is now in the driver's seat. If that wasn't creepy enough, Adam Soong is at the party and decides that when he can't get Picard to back down by scowling, he'll just hit him with his car instead. Picard survives but is taken to Teresa's clinic and hijinks ensue as they try to heal his synth body. Talon ultimately decides to go full Inception style and enter Picard's mind to figure out what's going on. But on the other side of town, Soong, after hitting a pedestrian with a car in front of witnesses in a city with millions of security cameras, is not arrested and goes home to see Corey. He passes out and she starts snooping through his computer. Turns out that Corey is one of many, many clones of the same girl, all who have the same genetic issues. All of them have died as kids and Corey is the only one who made it to her teens. She also learns that he's basically a mad scientist and needs to GTFO as soon as possible. But unfortunately, we need to interrupt this massive revelation for a full hour of trauma porn Inception style as we dive deep into Picard's subconscious. We see Picard sitting with a psychiatrist played by the real guy as Baltar, who is asking Picard who he really is. We dive into Picard's childhood with Talon, where Picard has set the story as a fairy tale in the dungeons under his house. Picard imagines his father as the monsters we're seeing, and his mother as the princess needing to be saved. When Talon gives him the courage to confront the monsters, he sees that his dad was trying to protect him and his mom by keeping her locked away from Jean-Luc. See, Jean-Luc's mom had major psychiatric issues, and his dad kept her locked up during her episodes so she couldn't hurt herself or others. Now, this is played as though it's a kind move, but it does mean that his dad was using 17th century mental illness strategies in the 23rd century, which is a bit scary. What, were leeches and bloodletting not an option? Subconscious Picard ultimately musters up the courage to open up the door where his mother is being held with a key he found in his pocket. This causes him to wake up. Now somehow, this is where things get even crazier. Rios brings Teresa and her son back to La Serena, throwing a massive wrench in the timeline. Jurati continues to do some crazy crap all around LA to keep those endorphins riding high, with Seven and Rafi in pursuit, and Talon is revealed to be a Romulan. So I guess time travel rules really do work the way they do in Back to the Future, where descendants look like exact copies for generations to come. Out of options, Picard decides to go to Guinan for help, and she uses some magic alcohol to try and summon Q. It doesn't work, and an FBI agent comes into the bar and arrests both of them, claiming he knows they're aliens. This subplot goes on for a while with literally no payoff except for one scene. Q visits Guinan while they're locked up to answer her summons. He tells Guinan he's dying. He has no powers and doesn't know how much life he has left. But once this ends, it turns out there's no hard proof, so they're all let go. Oh yeah, and we also find out that the lead detective is hellbent on finding aliens because he accidentally saw Vulcans as a kid. But back in the plot points that actually make just a sliver of sense, Corey is contacted by Q, who gives her the permanent antidote so she can escape her dad, leaving Adam a distraught mess when he loses his favorite experiment. And meanwhile, back in the hunt for the Queen, Seven remembers her assimilation as a girl and remembers metals being injected into her body to help with the assimilation process, and reasons that Jurati wants the same thing. We find Queen Jurati scarfing down car batteries, and she is none too happy when our power couple tells her the buffet is closed. They have a big fight where we see that Jurati still has some control when she prevented the Queen from killing Rafi, but ultimately she escapes. But the Queen isn't just wandering around aimlessly anymore. She heads right to Soong. She tells him that in the Darkest Future timeline, he's practically a god and boom, he's on board to mess some stuff up. The Queen has Soong get her some raw materials to advance her assimilation, as well as soldiers who she assimilates into Special Ops Borg drones. The Queen also has control over La Serena's transporters, and uses them to beam her and her new army to Chateau Picard to claim the ship for herself, hoping to assimilate everyone in the process. Using Talon's transporter, our heroes make it back to France in time to mount a resistance, and we have a battle on our hands. While the drone army attacks, Jurati battles the Queen for control and manages to deactivate all of La Serena's main systems, and stores the encryption code in the emergency combat hologram, now in the form of Elnor. She tells Elnor to play keep away, and what ensues is a good old-fashioned game of hide-and-seek and murder. Meanwhile, outside, everyone including Teresa and her son Ricardo are in Picard's house preparing for the oncoming attack. They're armed with whatever weapons they can find, consisting of some modern-day guns and Talon's Romulan disruptors. The drones advance 
advance, and Rios takes a bullet to the arm, trying to cover Teresa and Ricardo. Picard decides to use Talon's transporter to send them to her apartment and away from the fighting. Now this is probably something that may have been better to do before the actual battle and not during it, but he also tricks Rios into going with them and locks him out of transporting back, since he knew that Rios would probably get killed trying to protect everybody with his new injury. The remaining four decide to split up. Picard and Talon will stay behind, while Seven and Rafi will run a screen pass play and head to La Serena by going around the army. Now, this plan somehow works, and the incoming fire stops. Soong tries to convince Picard that all he wants is to be famous by helping the Borg and that he's not a bad guy, but Picard still has a few brain cells left despite all the wine drinking and says hard pass. Picard and Talon retreat into the tunnels under his house, guided by Picard's memories as he flashes back to playing hide-and-seek with his mom. Now, despite the incoming war, the show takes the time to give us a massive exposition dump. We learn that Seven was never able to enter Starfleet because humans don't like the Borg. Yeah, seriously. But fortunately, once the power couple makes it to the ship, we get some good exposition by Elnor telling Rafi that the real Elnor always loved her, finally giving her comfort as she blamed herself for his death because she convinced him to stay in Starfleet. And of course we get more of Picard's past. Picard flashes back to playing hide-and-seek with his mom and to that time constantly being cut short by his father. He also remembers hearing her cry for him from the other side of a locked door that his father had kept her behind. One night Picard found a key and opened it and found his mother had killed herself by hanging. Now, obviously he blames himself for this and this is apparently what has held him back from being able to love for so long. Geez, things are getting a little heavy. Let's get back to the battle. Back on the ship we see that Elnor is such a badass that he's killed all the Borg on the ship except the Queen. And she doesn't go down without a fight. She uses tentacles to damage Elnor's emitter and impale Seven through the stomach. The Queen goes to finish her but is stopped by Jurati. She and the Queen talk and see that the Borg is always doomed to fail because of its arrogance and single-minded strategies, and that the only reason the Queen wants to assimilate is because she's lonely. Now, setting aside this insanity for a moment, we get an interesting proposal. Jurati notes that Seven is one of the most powerful Borg due to her individuality, and that the new Borg should be a collective of the same. Unique individuals there by choice who embrace individuality. Now, I'm not sure how this will work or how good the Borg insurance will have to be to cover all those elective surgeries, but the Queen accepts and together they become a new entity, equally Queen and Jurati, and they use their nanoprobes to reborg Seven, saving her life. Back at the house, Soong has Picard and Talon cornered just as Rios is able to beam back, killing a drone and allowing Picard and Talon to dispatch the rest. Soong decides to run rather than fight and disappears. All of them go to La Serena and Quinati tells Picard there must be two Renes for the flight to succeed. One must live and one must die. And then she commandeers La Serena and heads for space. Our hero is optimistic that their former friend will do some good in the universe, setting aside the fact that she just stranded them in the past. Anyway, that brings us to the finale episode. Picard and Talon head to the launch to help Renee, and Picard tries to stop Talon from sacrificing herself to make sure that the launch succeeds, but she tells him to F off and swipes the launch uniform and goes to meet Renee. Rafi, Rios, and Seven head to Soong's house and see that he has headed to the launch himself, and that he has a bunch of attack drones targeted on the spacecraft. In a moment with a heap of manufactured tension, the drones launch but are all taken out by the crew. At the launch, Soong is trying to make his way to Renee, but Talon gets there first and talks to her about how she's her guardian angel and that Renee must go on the flight. We see Renee exit the room and run into Soong, who touches her on the face and offers to help her. He then gloats and tells her that he had a neurotoxin on his hand and she'll be dead soon. He takes his leave and we see that it was actually Talon under a hologram who was poisoned and she and Picard sit on the floor watching the shuttle launch with Renee at the helm. Talon dies content with the job of protecting Renee well done. Soong, now back at his lab, watches Renee on TV, wondering how he failed so hard and sees that Corey has deleted all his files on her. Distraught and with all his current work gone, he reaches into his desk for a folder labeled Project Khan. And this is where his storyline actually ends. But Corey receives a message on her laptop and follows it, meeting up with a familiar face. Wesley freaking Crusher. He's now a full-fledged traveler and is able to travel the cosmos, ensuring that the tapestry of the universe stays together. They employ the supervisors like Talon to make sure important events are never tampered with. He offers Corey the chance to travel with him and become a traveler just like the offer that was made to him as a child, and she accepts. With success now under their belt, everybody heads back to Chateau Picard. Rafi and Seven kiss to assure us they weren't just queerbaiting the audience this whole time, and Picard stows away the key for him to find in the future as a boy, accepting his past and moving on from it. And that's when Q shows up. He and Picard reminisce about their lives and how humans are defined by grief. This is actually really touching until we get the big reveal. Q did all of this to help Picard learn to love again before Q dies. Now, setting aside the fact that this is batshit crazy and doesn't explain why he wanted to stop Renee or help Adam or Corey, Q and Picard hug before Q offers to send them all back. Rios decides to stay with Teresa as she needs to run her clinic and chooses love over the future. The others agree and Q sacrifices himself to send everybody back to the future with his last bit of strength. We see that everybody is back aboard the Stargazer and that the Queen is still there, draining power. And of course, in the worst kept secret ever, the Queen is Jurati. The Queen tells him that there is a massive subspace corridor forming and that it will threaten the universe, but if the entire Starfleet fleet combines its shields, they can contain it. Picard agrees to turn over control of all the ships to Quinati, and she connects all the shields together except one has a malfunction. Rafi hails them and it turns out that Elnor is alive and was assigned to that ship and is currently fixing the problem. The shields connect and the day is saved. The Borg are given temporary Federation membership to guard the newly formed corridor, acting as a guardian at the gate. 
All is well again. Picard and Guinan share a drink and talk about Rios, with Guinan showing Picard a picture that had been in her bar before of Rios living in the past with Teresa. We find out that Teresa had died of old age, and that Rios died at an old age trying to secure medical supplies for the clinic. The series ends with Picard heading home and holding Laris' hands as we zoom out on the solarium, the part of the house where Picard most fondly remembers his mom. And there you have it, that is Picard Season 2. If you liked this video, remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and until next time, live long and prosper.